glad that thing didn't fall down when I shoved it up. I want to praise God for Brother Tom's testimony. What I love about Tom Burr and Fran is they have a great versatility. And what I mean by that is whoever comes into this church, they give them the time of day and show the love of Christ. And even being an older couple, you would think an older couple might not be so open to different people, but I find that they are. And so you can't even go by age in those things. It's probably by time with the Lord and in the scriptures. So we appreciate that testimony. We're glad you're still around. And I think Fran is pretty glad, too. Same movie. Uh, Jose, could you go with him? Jose, was that you, your brother or something? I mean, what's the deal? You were there in spirit. It was your spiritual manifestation. Anyway, don't get me started. Um, don't get me started. I want to say a little something about yesterday. Um, what was beautiful about yesterday at Annette uh, Brockington's memorial service is that we probably had about five other churches represented that she had been a part of, many of them in Amityville. And what you can learn from the Annette of, uh, life of Annette is that she never was out of church, no matter what was going on in her life. She made sure that she was in the house of the Lord, as she would say. And uh, she leaves behind a lot of legacies. I remember any time we'd have a Bible study and there was a workbook associated with it, she wanted that work, workbook and was going to do her homework. And she did. She believed in praying, praising and praying and tithing. And so, so many good things were instilled in her from her uh, adopted family, from an adopted family. Um, you know what? It would be easy. Many of you didn't really know Miss Annette, but I have a picture of her here. And if you saw Miss Annette, you'd realize that she's on some type of medication or something like that. And it would be easy to pass her up and not get to know her well. But for those of you that got to know her well, you understood her depth of understanding of the scriptures. You might have understood, too, her good counsel. She was straightforward. And boy, could she read people. You might not have thought she was looking at you good, but she, she could size somebody up. In an interesting way, she really, she really could. She had a type of discernment that even made me like, "Oh, how'd she know that?" You know, she knew that this was that type of person or whatever. And at the same time, um, I mean, she showed the love of Christ. What you might not know is she worked 25 years at a wonderful job and retired from it. She went to SUNY Abyss. The full obituary was read, read yesterday, and. She went to a couple of other colleges and even left college to take care of her parents. So that lady had a lot of good qualities that you might have missed and maybe you might have passed her up. Uh, I guess the moral of the story is get to know God's people no matter who they are because you never know who you might be passing up. I'd like to also, I, I praise God for Sheila, my wife, because she really considered her a friend. And I think, you know, both ways, whereas they spent a lot of time together and you wouldn't have thought, you know, it's not like Sheila's taking care of a person who has some kind of disability. They were friends. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And people, all kinds of people need friendships. I don't care if they're on medication or what's going on. So just tuck that away. Um, kind of a lesson before the lesson, right? Um, and it was wonderful because that, and I commend all of you as well, because as a church family, Annette knew there was something special here. She knew the word of God was here, and she knew the love of Christ was here. And she normally would go to different type churches, probably all black churches that were a lot louder than us. us. I'm being honest. You know, I'm an honest guy like that. But she knew there was something special here. And... She would go from here sometimes to the Helping Hands Church down the block because they had a choir that would go up there and they would always let her sing up in the choir. And so she was a two-church lady of many, of many Sundays. That's how much she loved the fellowship of God's people and the worship of God. On that note, let's pray. We'll get into today's message.
Lord, I thank you that you've given us a heart at Calvary to care for people that sometimes others might think are the least of And Lord, I give you praise. I pray we would always be a church that embraces the various people that come through the doors. Thank you so much for who you've brought to the church for so many years. Lord, your faithfulness is apparent. From the 1960s up until today, you've always supplied what the church needed, and certainly you brought many wonderful saints. And whether they've stayed here or moved on to other states, even attended other churches, we give you praise that, Lord, we've had the privilege of ministering to many people. And I pray in the years to come as you give it to us that that might continue in strength. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come to an important topic. It's a topic that Joel Osteen and others avoid. But we find out that the Bible is replete with references to hell. 162 references to hell in the New Testament alone. 70 by Jesus himself. Think about that for a second. You really wouldn't want to be a preacher that never speaks about what Jesus speaks about, right? And the question that's come up for people in the evangelical world is how long does it last? Some would believe in eternal conscious torment. Others would believe in something called annihilation or another variation of that would be um, adding conditional immortality, which would mean that people would suffer for a while and then be annihilated at some point. And so as in every topic in the Bible, uh, we have to see you know, what the Bible says and what the Bible says it says, right? And whatever it says, think of it this way. We know that God is good and God is a God of justice. So whatever the Bible does say, God is right. Let God be true and every man a liar, right? Any topic in the Bible is important too. And I was thinking, I had spoken at a, a small conference on this just this uh, last weekend. And what was interesting was when I brought this up, I said, you know, if unbelievers heard this deal that, you know, they're just going to be annihilated, I could see many of them high-fiving each other and saying, you know, we might as well party it up and eat, drink, and be merry because we're going to, you know, we're just going to be gone. We're just going to be gone. And certainly that kind of doctrine makes believers feel better because I'm sorry, I suppose that none of us is comfortable with the fact that our relatives who've died are in hell forever. That is a tough concept, no doubt. But whatever it says, it says, right? A Bible church is a Bible church. All scripture is inspired by God and good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. And as I said before, God's character can't be impugned because whatever it says, it says. So, on that note, I felt like I wanted to go to a part two for this message. Now, Dick Mayhew of the Master Seminary says this, a few noted evangelicals such as Clark Pinnock, John Stott, and John Wenham have in recent years challenged the doctrine of eternal torment forever in hell as God's final judgment in all believers. Now, those are pretty big names in the evangelical world, but Clark Pinnock really says something kind of really strange here. Listen to this. I don't want to nickname him Pinocchio, but I guess I have to. But anyway, uh, you know, another guy later, his name is Ed Fudge. But anyway, there is a moral revulsion against the traditional doctrine of the nature of hell. Everlasting torture is intolerable. And he's saying the idea of eternal hell is intolerable. He's saying it's like a bad idea. It's wrong, right? Everlasting torture is intolerable, intolerable from a moral point of view because it pictures God acting like a bloodthirsty monster who maintains an everlasting Auschwitz for his enemies, who does not even allow them to die. How can anyone love a God like that? Now, this is a man who in the past wrote some good things. You know, he's evangelical, and he says that. Now, what's interesting, um, and he also piggybacked on that to say that uh, eternal hell, you know, there's cruelty involved, it's savage, it's sadism, it's vindictive. And there are two statements that are pretty interesting. One by Millard Erickson, a good theologian. He said, he better be sure he's right, for otherwise 
if he's wrong, he's guilty of blasphemy against God. D.A. Carson said this, if they are wrong, they're all using these words of God. Now, I sat back and thought about that. That's true. So in other words, if the Bible says that hell's eternal, and that's God, if we sit back and say that, you know, we believe the Bible doesn't teach that. If the Bible did, this is a bad God who's an evil God and all that. You see the problem? If they are wrong, D.A. Carson says, they're using all these words of God. And if they're right, they're using all of those words of the overwhelming majority of the Christian brothers and sisters across the last two millennia, including not a few of the best believers in church history. John Stott said this, and John Stott has written some good books. He's probably the best one of the bunch, but on this topic, not. He said, I find the concept intolerable. He's talking about eternal torment. I find the concept intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. That's what John Stott said. So it's happened, too, in more recent times, a man by the name of uh, Edward Fudge, he wrote a, a book called The Fire That Consumes. It's not a funny topic. I gotta, gotta, gotta get a couple laughs here. The Fire That Consumes, it's a big 500 page book on this topic. And he, he's one that advocates that, you know, hell is not eternal, the conditional immortality thing. God only grants immortality to the saved, but not to the unsaved. That's one of their angles on this as well. And so. It's gaining some popularity, but I don't think too much. Uh, but it's gaining some popularity. So anyway, it, it's an important topic for us to look at. Uh, by the way, in the history of the church, there really hasn't been too many prominent people that espoused this doctrine. Origen did. Origen did. Um, saying, oh, the Christian church was influenced uh, about their uh, belief in immortality by, uh, by Plato or the lack of immortality believed by Plato. That's not true. It really wasn't until the 5th century, um, you know, uh, Mayu writes, however, by the 5th century, the doctrine of everlasting punishment in hell was not seriously challenged. And um, so from the 5th century on, there hasn't been much of a challenge. Now, there was a challenge in the 1980s and 1990s when some of these guys began to write books. So just so you know a little bit of the history of the doctrine. Um, and by the way, as far as annihilation, which is this idea that you just snuffed out of existence, guess who believes in those, in those doctrines, or in that doctrine, I should say? It was espoused in the, um, by, Jehovah, by Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians. Not really a great bunch at all. So anyway... And many annihilationists embraced other heresies. So in other words, they didn't just you know, uh, not believe hell in the right way, but they embraced some heresies about the person of Christ. And that included Locke and Newton and uh, Samuel Clark and other uh, Arians who denied the full deity of Christ. So those who espouse you know, hell not being forever, it's not really, it's not a great bunch. Now, as far as this doctrine of, of hell being eternal, who, who, who does espouse it and who did espouse it? Well, uh, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, uh, John Wesley, uh, the writers of, I have systematic theologies, I might have about eight of them, and you could stack, I almost was going to bring it to the conference and stack them up, but that included, you know, that included all kinds of guys, you know, Hodges and Warfield and Millard Erickson and, you know, just a whole you know, all of them, really. I don't even know if there's a systematic theology that, that doesn't have that. And then when you think of modern-day theologians and pastors, including John Piper and John MacArthur and Steve Lawson and R.C. Sproul and Bodie Bauckham and Sinclair Ferguson and Joel Beakey and the Westminster Confession and on and on and on. William Perkins and Richard Baxter and John Owen and on and on. Believe that hell's eternal from the Scripture. Not just because they want to, but because the Bible says it. So anyway, so we come to the topic of hell. Now, when we come to it, we definitely want to come with a heart of compassion, right? Before I say that, I want to read a statement by Richard Mayhew that I think is good. God's justice is often brought to the forefront of the discussion. 
Isn't eternal punishment unjust? as unjust as retribution for non-eternal violation. Yet it must be remembered that God defines and sets the standard for what is just and unjust. That's a good statement. God's the one who sets the rules, right? I mean, he's God. The scriptures reveal whatever the measure is, and thus he's saying an exegetical, not a philosophical approach. In other words, he's saying digging into the Bible for what it really says is what counts. Rather than philosophizing on the side, it should be... Is, is this loving for God to do this? And that doesn't mean anything as much as what does the Bible say? That's what he's saying. An exegetical, not a philosophical approach is the only one with satisfactory answers. It could just be that sin against an eternally holy God is far more serious from his perspective than from the human point of view. Sin is more, when as I was studying this, sin is more serious than I ever thought. So, keep in mind that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You come... You and I come to this doctrine with a heart of compassion for the lost because we deserve the same punishment. So we don't come on any high horse because we didn't deserve what we got. We deserve, quite the contrary, the very hell we're talking about today. You and I deserved it, and we were spared by Jesus. That should do something for us, too, from that angle, right? God said in Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Jeremiah said that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Are you broken up over the lost? Didn't Jesus say of Israel, I wanted to gather Israel's again, have, gathers her chicks, but you were unwilling. Didn't he, didn't he weep for Jerusalem? What about the Apostle Paul? His own Jewish brethren, Romans 9, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Why? For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So, why did Jesus have to come to die? You know, if there really wasn't a hell and God's wrath against sin wasn't so bad, why would he have to go to the cross? Is one angle we can take on this, right? Why such a severe punishment? You know that the wrath of God is against all the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, and yet God's wrath was poured on his son for sinners at the cross, right? Sin is so serious that God the Father would send his own perfect son to suffer the full cup of his wrath. Think about that. So in other words, the punishment has to be pretty bad, right? I don't know if it's just for a little while for people. Romans 5, 9 says, since therefore we have been now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. In this is love, 1 John 4, 10, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It satisfied the righteous wrath of God, Jesus' death. Satisfied his wrath. If there was no eternal hell, why would Jesus have to suffer like that? Right? I like what Paul, Paul Dirk said in his book, Is There Anything Good About Hell? This is a good statement. Listen. The suffering Jesus endured had an aspect of eternity to it, and that he suffered the that the suffering inflicted upon an eternal being of infinite worth. Everything's eternal about Jesus, right? Everything's infinite about him. His value, his suffering, the punishment. All of the punishment that was due sinners was put on Christ, and because of his eternity, his suffering was sufficient to satisfy the requital of an eternal And Peterson, Robert Peterson said this, and he's the, the writer of the book, Two Views of Hell, and he had the, the, biblical, well, the biblical view in there. Ed Fudge had the other view. 
Because of the infinite dignity of Christ's person, his sufferings, though finite in duration, were of infinite weight on the scales of divine justice. That's a good statement. Infinite weight on the scales of divine justice. Some people from the other side are saying, oh, Jesus only died six hours on the cross. And so then they're going to they're gonna say, well, that's why hell is limited or should be limited. But what did he do in those six hours? What kind of a death was it? Was it of infinite worth? Did he suffer hell for us, so to speak? I think so. So that's one angle we could take on it, right? Um, hell, by the way, was originally created for who? Devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, and we'll make reference, this is the important, really important passage. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. Now, the word eternal is going to loom large in this. When I was at the conference where there were people on both sides of the issue, that word eternal loomed large. So anyway, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We usually have no problem with the devil and his angels going there, right? Demons. I don't mind that they go to hell forever. But what about your neighbor who's relatively nice? Gets hard in your mind in a way, right? But watch this. Is there original sin? Yes, but everybody sins after that. We could argue that children before the age of accountability are covered special by the Lord. But everybody ends up sinning. They're born, born sinner and end up sinning. But watch. Jesus says in Mark 9, 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him that if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Again, hyperbole. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell. By the way, don't use that terminology. To, don't tell people to go to hell. That's a bad thing. It says they go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Interesting, unquenchable fire. Can't quench it. Um, what does that mean? Gehenna, translated from two Hebrew words, Valley of Hinnon, a place south of Ju Jerusalem where, unfortunately, children were sacrificed to Molech. There's also a good argument that it was some kind of terrible garbage dump where the fires never ceased kind of thing. And so no wonder the Lord uses it as an illustration of hell. During the reforms of uh, King Josiah, it was a garbage dump where fires burned continually. I try to just think clearly about the Bible. If it's unquenchable fire, that means there's an endless supply of fuel. Jesus goes on, Mark 9. If your foot causes, and I'm highlighting the fact that it's sin that sends people to hell. And we have to let people know that. Look how serious Jesus is about sin. I mean, if cutting a part of your body would keep you out of hell, it would be better to do that than to go with your whole body to hell. Isn't that what he's saying? No matter what you've got to do, repent, turn, radically turn from your sin and turn to Christ before it's too late. That's what he's saying, right? If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame with two feet than to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. And then here's a big statement. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So now what does that mean? You know, you go to Isaiah 66 and it makes reference there. I won't read the whole verse to the new heavens and the new earth that God's going to make. And then in that text, in verse 24, it says, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who rebelled, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched. So what do we say about this? Again, same thing. It would seem to me that the activity of the punishment continues. It doesn't stop. Isn't that sad for unbelievers? Doesn't it make you want to witness to them and help them be rescued? If this is the case, how else could you interpret that, really? 
Some, some of the other writers were emphasizing the worm too much. Some were just saying it's like dead bodies, maggots on a, on a corpse, and then it, it, the corpse gets eaten up and it's gone. And they were just extrapolating that into the discussion about whether hell is eternal. Not a fair way to do it. Others would say, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah was you know, put to ashes, so people are going to be put to ashes, and then they'll be done. But you can't do that. You always got to, it's a misuse of context. The context here is eternal punishment. And in the other places. Now go to Matthew 25. Here is the blockbuster verse. Actually, a blockbuster passage. Matthew 25. And even when somebody was presenting, they said, this is the only one they got. Because you know what? They were highlighting the verses that, where Jesus says that don't be afraid of him. Uh, who can kill the body, but be afraid of him who could destroy both body and soul in hell. And so those verses were emphasized. But it, what's interesting about those verses, I'll say more, it ter even when it says eternal ruin, ruin or eternal destruction, that's what it means. Eternally being destroyed, rendered useless, futile. All these words have a range of meaning and context of the passage and context of the whole Bible come into play. Whenever you're studying a doctrine, you want to make sure that your conclusion fits the most verses possible. See what I'm saying? You can't just kind of take one verse or, or even some, some proof texts. Sure, if there were no, if eternal was never used, then maybe we would believe the other way. But eternal's used a lot, brothers and sisters. And here's one passage where this is the sheep goat judgment, the judgment of Gentiles. We could argue this is the uh, judgment of even individuals before the millennial kingdom. Again, that's a whole thing. We'll get into that when we get into Matthew 24 and 25, as I anticipate getting back into Matthew next week, our regular uh, passages. Matthew 25, 31, go there. When a son of man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, and he'll sit on his glorious throne. God has a right to judge, right? Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he'll separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He's dealing with individuals here, not just nations. And look what he says. This is so interesting. I look forward to it when we preach on this passage specifically in the future, by God's grace. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world people are going to heaven forever. The people that he's chosen. So why are they going to heaven? Well, they trusted in, in Jesus as Lord and Savior. We know that. The whole Bible speech speaks that. The verses now that are going to be mentioned here, it's almost going to make it seem like it's a salvation by works, but no. Works show you've been saved. Always remember that. Faith without works is dead because a true faith is going to manifest itself in good works. A good tree, Jesus said, produces good fruit. Yeah, it's just like a simple concept in Scripture. And that's what's being said here. It's interesting, though, what's being used. And you say, it's going to mention people that are hungry and thirsty. You say, who are these people? Could it be people in the tribulation time that are hiding from the Antichrist forces? This could be what it is. Jews and Gentiles alike. It's very interesting, this section. This is a very interesting section to interpret. But watch. Just think about it, though. Jesus says, For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Ooh. You say, oh, well, that's tribulation time. We don't got to worry about people that are thirsty and hungry. That's not the idea. You don't just, even, if, even if it is primarily to that time period, what is it? how does it speak to us? Let your light shine before men, right? We want to be those, as in Titus it says, that, you know, to do good works. Bible say about the poor anyway. Proverbs fourteen thirty one. 
Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors him. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever, this is an interesting one, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will call out himself and not be answered. Oh, but when it's a poor, eh, he probably, he probably doesn't want to work. Is that the attitude that you want to have without even talking to the guy? I would think no. So I want you to think about this. Jesus is commending, and especially when you stumble upon a fellow believer, especially when you stumble upon a, a fellow believer. Interesting, I saw on Facebook that John Bon Jovi was washing, uh, there was a picture of him washing, washing dishes, dishes at a, a restaurant that feeds the homeless. I thought that was good. I don't know much about him, but that's interesting. Someone like that? Hmm. It's hard for me, I'll be honest with you, when I see passages like this, it's hard for me when I see somebody at a shopping center just to brush past them. Because, not because of me, I mean, Jesus in me, or whatever he's done in my life, it's hard for me to pass them by. You say, why? Well, you want to give people the gospel. You know, I was by the Aldi's in Patchogue with my son, and there was this tall fellow, he's 6'6", six, six, and he was shaking his foot in a funny way against the wall, and I don't know what was going on. So I said, hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? And lo and behold, he quotes... 1 Corinthians 10, 13 to me, no temptation has taken you, but it, such as is common to man. Apparently, he went to Teen Challenge, and he got out, and he had a job. He was working for seven months, but then his housing fell apart, and he got discouraged. And so I went to where he, he was. I had to go pick up Jim Hazleton, who comes on Wednesday nights because he was at the barber. We were at the Bible study at the pharmacy together. And then I brought Jim. Jim had a great talk with this guy, bless his heart. Jim gave this guy truth and everything and, and told him the hard times that he went through. And, and I'm not sure if this man knows the Lord, but I went to where he was. He's behind the um, Pet Boys and whatever other store it is, and, and he could hardly walk. And he, he goes down an incline, and he's in the back. He's got a lounge chair back there. He's got a tarp that's over the top. And so anyway, trying to figure out if he knows the Lord and – he did say that. I said, would you want a radio that you could hear, you know, family radio? You know what? He was rattling off to me the names of Christian singers, David Meese and, and all these guys from the past. And so anyway, so what's the point? Does Jesus care about guys like this? That's why I can't, I can't just pass them up. I can't just pass them up. And I hope that you have your eyes open for people that you can minister to as well, please. Um, where did I get this quote from? Oh, think of the Jews in the Holocaust. Some courageous believers hid those Jews. Would you and I have done it? I don't know. That's a hard one. Would I have hid the Jews in the Holocaust? <laughs> so Jesus' statements are pretty heavy here. They're kind of convicting, not just to say, oh, it's, you know, that's for that other time period, the tribulation time, you know. I don't know if we should necessarily think like that. Uh, I forgot where I get this quote. Let's see. I think it's a good quote. The brethren are the Christian poor and needy suffering. And oh, yeah, I remember. The, the brethren are the Christian poor and needy suffering in the first place. Uh, but ultimately and inferentially, F.F. Bruce says, any suffering people anywhere. All right, let's move on. Verse 41. Now, what's Jesus going to say to those going to hell? Matthew 25, 41. Take a look at it. Then he'll say to those on his left. Depart from me, you cursed, into, into what kind of fire? The eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, why are those guys cursed? Well, we know they didn't trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, right? But look what it says. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. I was even convicted that I did not keep up with Miss Annette for a while there, when she was nursing homes and all of that, and eventually I lost track. 
and I'm sad that I lost track. I'm, I praise God that God gave me the privilege of, as a pastor, trying to really keep up with her when she was here and in, the, in some of the aftermath. But we are our brother's keeper, amen, brothers and sisters? And we're a team to do this. We need each other's help to take care of people. We need each other's help, we do. So, um, verse 44, then we'll, they will also answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Is that convicting or what? I think so. But now, here's the crux of, crux of the matter. Look at verse 46. Look at verse 46. And these will go into what type of punishment? And the righteous into what type of life? Am I going crazy or are those parallel? And by the word, the Greek word does mean, it could mean a long time, it could mean ages, or it could mean forever. And the same word is used of God in, uh, in Romans 16. He's quoted, or it's said there that he's eternal God. Same word. How long does eternal life last? For all eternity. And it's paralleled there with eternal punishment. Is it a hard doctrine? It sure is. I don't think any of us who love our families and friends and neighbors, you know, but doesn't it make you want to love them all the more and live the Lord in front of them and tell them the gospel all the more before it's too late? Eternal is used 44 times in the gospel of John alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. They, they jump on that word. The other side to say perish means gone. Everlasting life. But it's contrast with everlasting life. Augustine said something great. Isn't that something a man from a long time ago got it right? Watch this. Augustine. Is it not folly to assume that eternal punishment signifies a fire that lasts a long time while believing that eternal life is without end. For Christ, in the very same passage, this is Augustine, a zillion years ago, this guy, right? Unbelievable. For Christ, in the very same passage, included both punishment and life in one, and in the same sentence he said, so those will go into eternal punishment while the righteous go into eternal life. If both are eternal, it follows necessarily that either both are to be taken as long-lasting but finite or both as endless and perpetual. Smart guy, huh? The phrases eternal punishment, eternal life are parallel, and it would be absurd to use them in one and the same sentence to mean eternal life will be Tears. We don't just say, oh, good for them, because that could have been us. What if the Lord's grace didn't come to you and I? Where is there a cause for boasting? For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. If it was, we'd be going around parading ourselves. I'm better than you, better than you. Nobody's better than, am I better than the guy out there who's not saved yet? When it says eternal, it really means, and they had to do a lot to define it. I said, oh, you got to read a 500-page book by Ed Fudge to redefine eternal? Ed Fudge. I said he's smooth as chocolate. Anyway. It's a hard sermon. I got a little bit of, little bit of relief in it. Um, they're going to say that when it's eternal, like they, they take a passage like, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, it says of Jesus, uh, Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation. And they're like, look, ah, the 
word eternal means you got saved and the results are eternal. So eternal punishment means they get annihilated and the results are eternal. I don't see that. I don't see how you can. That's kind of gymnastics in there, so you can't do it. Another text, Hebrews 7, 24. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Well, that's clear. You can't, you can't muff up that one. Go to Revelation 14 now. There's some interesting texts in Revelation. And some of the guys on the other side, they don't look in Revelation. Ah, there's so much symbolism in there and blah, blah, blah. And they, they seemingly try to slip up out of these passages. But we can't let them do it. Can't let them do it. Revelation 14, 9. You can't. Revelation is a great book. There's even a blessing for reading it at the beginning, right? I like what John MacArthur says about Revelation because he, you know, very much holds, you know, the pre-trib position and rapture and all of that. And it seems like the, all the other guys on the other side have so many other views. It's all mixed up. And, that you know, you can't really take Revelation, you know, literally, right, at all. We take things literal, literal until the text demands you take it figurative or symbolic or something, right? Got to take that approach. Anyway, let me not get into that. That's another message. Revelation 14. Voice, if anybody worship the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehand or on his head, he'll also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment goes up, those worshipers of the beast and its image who receives the mark of his name. So, the people that are going to be punished in hell, the smoke of their torment goes up how long? It says forever. But then the other side would say, well, it's just the smoke. They're gone. They get burned out to ashes, and the smoke keeps going. Well, I mean, there's always a way. Now, they do take an Old Testament passage, Isaiah 34, which they threw a curveball my way when I first heard I didn't think about it. It's some, something about the smoke of Edom going up forever. But everything on passage, he could symbolize the fact that your punishment is done and then the symbol of it goes up. God could say that if he wants, but not in this passage in Revelation because it's emphatic, they have no rest day or night. Oh, but then, then they throw at me, but there's no day or night in heaven. Oh, guys, come on now. We know there's no day or night in heaven, but it's speaking in terms here that people would understand that it never ceases. It never ceases. Well, I don't know if we should shun them, brother, but I want to spend, if in as much as they're willing to speak with us, to spend time and to give them what I believe is the truth. Because people who espouse this, otherwise they had good reputation in their churches. Some have left churches recently. But, so anyway, I was at this conference to defend what I believe is the truth. So anyway, Revelation 17, 8. Revelation 17, 8. Now look at this one. Now the beast, they just threw this one out, man, because they don't know who the beast is. I don't know if I know exactly who the beast is, but I know the false prophet and the beast have a lot to do with the end times, right? I'm not going to identify them specifically, but this is interesting. The beast that you saw was and is not and about to rise from the bottomless pit. This has not happened yet, by the way. And they end, go to, to destruction. There's the word destruction. There's that word that they're going to say destruction means they're gone. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and it is not and it is, is to come. So the beast is going to go to destruction. That, that would mean that he's gone, right? This beast should be long gone. But lo and behold, well, before I say that, it says also in verse 11, the beast that was and is not and is an eighth but belongs to the seventh, it goes to destruction. Now we go to Revelation 20. Interestingly enough, after the thousand years, who's released? Well, it's interesting. Well, not just who's released, but who's going to be tormented day and night forever watch. So the beast is still around. So presumably, I'm trying to say that he's still around, right? Verse 7 of Revelation 20. And when a thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison. By the way, some people think we're in a thousand years now. 
and that the church is going to usher in a golden age. We'll get into that when we get to Matthew 24. I don't see it. I wish that we were being ushered into a golden age where the gospel would spread so much, even the governments are going to be all righteous and everything. Do you see that happening? It seems to be going the other way. So the thousand years are really the thousand years future to us yet, after the tribulation. Anyway, we'll get to that, all of that someday. And when a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released. Because they're, say, they're saying, they have to say Satan's bound now. Don't you wish the devil was bound right now? Oh, man. The devil's bound? I'm like, you know. Anyway, I just try to take it. I don't know. And when a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He'll come out again to deceive the nations on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. When has this battle happened? It hasn't, right? Gather them for battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Uh-oh, it's consumed again, right? We know what they're going to say for that. And the devil who deceived them, here's the important part, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast, why is the beast still around? I thought he was destroyed. Why is he still around? They don't put too much stock in this, by the way. I gave it to, ah, that's book of Revelation. Hard to understand. Where the beast and the false prophet were, and they'll be tormented, here it is again, day and night. How long? There it is. I don't see how we worm our way out of this. Well, we don't want to because we want to take the scriptures for what they say, right? That's all I want to do. It's all you want to do. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, even though the hell was prepared for the devil and, and a angels, unfortunately for the unbelievers who follow in his rebellion, the same punishment. Not exactly the same because there's a big passage where Jesus says some will be punished with few stripes, some with many stripes. Of course, they use that to say that few stripes means for a short time and many stripes a long time. Better interpretation would be the magnitude of the punishment. Is there a better part of hell? I mean, there's a lot of things that are mysterious for us, granted. Is one part of hell a little better than the other part? I, I don't know how exactly how it works, but just want to take the Bible for what it says. Some will get a lighter sentence. Interesting, right? Very interesting topic. I'm almost glad to study it in detail. It's a good thing. Study something in detail to know it. Um, I urge you to do the same. Because you want to know the verses. You know, you might meet somebody. You might bump into somebody who's wondering about this topic. Again, and think about it. There's people who might be hearing this topic and at first be persuaded by it, but then you come along and give them a better view of it, and they might take a better turn back. All right? Think of all the things where you and I, hopefully we're all growing, and through the years we've learned and changed our position on a certain topic. Even John MacArthur has changed on topics. There was a time, eternal sonship of Jesus. And then he changed on it, to his credit. MacArthur be the first one to tie. I've heard him say it. Nobody's perfect in doctrine, and certainly nobody here is perfect in life. <laughs> so we've got to watch our what? Life and doctrine closely, brothers and sisters. Be careful before being too judgmental toward, toward others, I urge you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Make a study. Uh, through the Bible of God's righteous judgment. It's all over the place. He's just righteous. He can't do wrong. Whenever people give me questions or whenever I face something that's hard in life, it's like I can't impugn the character of God. Even Job said, though he slay me, right? Look what happened to Job. How many kids did he lose? What was it, 10? 8, 10? Though he slay me, he was still going to praise God. And he was, hey, he, was, he was feeling it, cursing the day of his birth and other things. He wasn't just whistling Dixie. And his wife said, curse God and die, and he didn't. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean we don't just trust God. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. Context. Believers are being persecuted and being hurt even, probably physically. But since God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, God, you never have to get revenge because God's going to take care of it. 
and to grant relief to those who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of, it says, eternal destruction. Gone, or does it mean a destruction in the sense that they're based on all that we've read, and even the context of these passages, it would be an eternal punishment. Eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. How do I know that destruction? Well, the word destruction is used in other places where it does not mean annihilate. 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, you, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That doesn't necessarily mean the annihilation of his flesh. So, In fact, the guy was put out of the church so the devil would work on him so he'd come to his senses and come back to the Lord as he should. Right? The destruction of his flesh, the ruin of his flesh. So those are used even in the temporal sense, the same word. It says it in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, while people are saying there is peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. Again, and actually we never see in the Bible where these, it never, does say, it never says annihilation. If the Bible was going to be clear that the unbelievers are just gone, I think it would be clear that the unbelievers are gone. Right? I don't think the Lord's going to make it so ambiguous. It would just say that I, I burn them up with the fire of hell and they're gone and they are no more. Why, why doesn't it just say that? Right? Why doesn't it just say that if hell's not eternal? And then they pulled on me, 1 Corinthians 15, where it says death will be no more. And that was a tricky one. That was the curveball. I was like, oh, I'm standing there like, death will be no more. Well, physical death will be no more. And I suppose as God has an eternal punishment, he puts death to an end in some sense. But, you know, people want to argue about those kind of things. So anyway. Oh, but those to a temptation and a snare and to many senseless and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Is that annihilation or ruin? Just ruin. I suppose by rejecting Christ, we go to eternal ruin. And the word eternal is put in front of it, eternal destruction. Well, we, I, I'm not going to read the parable again, but the rich man, he was in torment, it says, and he wanted some relief. He didn't even think he should get out. In fact, if you really think about it, the people that do go to hell, they're going to understand why they're there. Isn't that heavy? It's a heavy thought. Now, there's a big debate about whether they, they keep sinning or they've stopped their sin and just being punished. You know, I don't even want to get into that. Do I know all of that? I, I can't say that I know for sure. Is it sad? Sure. Is it righteous? Yes. So I'm like anyone else, like the Apostle Paul. You, you're broken up over. You should be broken up over people going to hell. At the same time, it should do something for us. We've been rescued from that. Think about that. I don't think we think about that often enough. I was rescued. If I drowned in Lake Runcocoma in 1979, before I got saved in college in 1980, Pandolfi would have went to hell. I deserved hell like anybody else. Praise God. Can you imagine we've been rescued from that? We should be praising him a little more, I think, from this doctrine. All doctrine should do something to us. You say, oh, the Old Testament never says that. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. At, the, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is in charge of your people. Kind of like, you know, God's angel looking over the Jewish people. At the end, the time of Jacob's trouble, there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since a nation till that time. Some people tell me the great tribulation took place already. Can't, I don't believe that either. Because in Matthew it says a, a tribulation that has never been since the beginning of the, the earth. They're saying, oh, but it was a terrible time when Jesus was crucified. That's what they're trying to say. That's the great tribulation that Jesus was crucified. No, it's talking about pestilences and like Revelation says, a third of the earth burned, burned up and all of that. That hasn't happened yet. 
A preterist is one who believes that those, many of those things happened already. And that affects your interpretation of the Bible. You see that? Anyway, that's all another thing. There shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone whose name was found written in the book. And watch this. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting, everlasting. Again, parallel. In parallel. What choice do we have? Of course, then they'll minimize the word contempt. Sheep go judgment. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Where else is the word eternal used? Listen to this one from Revelation. Revelation is as inspired as any other book. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, is used of God. Same words. This forever and ever is used of the Lord. He doesn't end, does he? And the 24 elders before him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And ever and ever. Revelation 10, 5 and 6. And Andrew, whom I saw standing on the, sea, on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what was in it, the earth and what was in it, and the sea and what was in it. Revelation 15, 17. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And that's what clinched it for me. I've always believed hell was eternal, but I did want to really research it. You know, you want to go to the scriptures and say, all right, what does it say and where does it say it? Just like in end times, I'm looking forward to doing that when we come to Matthew 24. By God's grace next week, I think we're in Matthew 15. I want to dig into it. And I hope you want to... Dig in. Brothers and sisters, dig in. It's an exciting thing to dig in. Because we've got to know what we believe and why we believe it. Because there's going to be more challenges. These, it's not the only challenge that's going to come up. There's going to be more. More and more and more. So watch this. So, I suppose be more thankful for your salvation, right? What do we learn from it? I've been rescued from eternal punishment, eternal death, eternal fire. People debate over what type of fire it is. I won't even want to debate on it. It's eternal fire. And people are able, unfortunately, able to suffer it. And we've been rescued from that. And then we get to go to heaven forever and ever? It's crazy. It's crazy. In a place where there's no pain. Here's at the memorial service, of course, always, always mention Revelation 21, speaking about heaven in the presence of the Lord and his people. But watch this. Since hell's eternal, as Lazarus wanted his brother to be warned to come to a place like this, we should warn unbelievers about this place and tell them how they could be rescued from that place, right? And by the power of the Holy Spirit, boldly declare the good news that there is a Savior who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest who was sent by a sovereign God who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Watch this, last story. You all remember the Titanic. Pastor John Harper and his daughter boarded the Titanic. The reason he was traveling is he was invited to speak at Moody Church and presumably becoming their next pastor. But then the ti Titanic hit the iceberg. He got his daughter to safely, safety, and Harper was running from person to person, passionately telling them about Jesus. Harper was heard shouting, women, children, and the unsaved into the lifeboats. He was saying to saved, give up your lives. Let the unsaved get in. Do we have that? Do, yeah, it makes sense. Do we have that kind of commitment to reach the lost? Compared to Harper, we look like, I don't know, but anyway. Rebuffed by a certain man at the offer. So a guy's making fun of him. Rebuffed by a certain man at the offer of salvation. 
Potiphar gave him his own life vest, saying, you need this more than I do. That's heavy. Potiphar pleaded with people to give the life, their lives to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if hell is eternal, we should do the same. Let's pray. Brothers and sisters, I know that we've always believed that hell is eternal. And now you're hearing more of the word of God on it. You're thinking about it. I did make a verse list so you can go through all the verses yourself. I thought that was the easiest way instead of giving you an outline today. There's a verse list on the table. I urge you to do your own study and think through what we spoke today and let it have its effect on you. Does that make sense? Let it have its effect. As uh, Brother Lou prays for the offering, let's become more serious about evangelism because of it. Brother Lou. Lord, we give you praise in all things, O oh God, and we thank you for that gift of eternal life, Lord. What a God you are. What a God. And Lord, as we go through this air life, Lord, let us keep our minds set upon you in all things. We give you praise as we take this offering. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, we have quite a day lined up today. Uh, Sheila and I will be skipping out uh, soon because John, I'm, I'm going to eat so much today. John Davis invited us to a special dinner at his church at like 1.30, so we got to skip out real soon. And then there's a special dinner at this church. That's good. That's what Baptist churches are all No, that's not what they're all about. <laughs> um, but at 4.30 today is the Fishers of Men meal that that the ladies graciously, I saw them bringing bags upon bags in. I'm, I guess the place is going to be decorated and piles of food that we men need to eat like Vikings or something. So, Lord willing, I hope you're able to make it at 4.30. Let them know. you got to let everybody know. If you're on the sheet, you're on the sheet already. If you still plan to come, and I invited some brand new wonderful people that came, Dean and Kezia. Kezia. No, say it. Kezia. Kezia. You guys want to come later? Oh, but I put them on the spot. It's up to you guys. You tell tell Miss Brenda over there and Miss Kelly over there whether you want to come, right? So let them know. Well, anyway, well, um, oh, where was I? So, and tonight, Brother Errol, were you going to preach in Isaiah tonight? All right. And, and the reason, say, why are we going to still have a service or have a report? We might have people still come tonight. We'll see. We might adjust the time a little bit so Errol can have all the plates of food that he wants. Though. Carolyn's making sure he eats healthy. So just eat, make sure you eat your salad tonight, Errol. And um, <laughs> um, other, men can, uh, other men can eat like Vikings, I suppose, but not Errol. Um, I was going to tell you something else. What other announcement was there? Two, oh, Tuesday night, servant team meeting. It's the second Tuesday of the month. So Tuesday night's our regular servant team meeting. Wednesday night's our Bible study. Uh, Matt. Oh, well, you better ask Alex Lonzano that. We've appointed Alex to coordinate the next one. I believe it'll be the, the third Thursday of the month. Did we say that was good? So Alex will confirm that. He, he's going to say a stronger year next time. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I'm goofing with him. I'm goofing with him. Alex is a good man. And uh, we uh, actually, we had a vote in the hallway one day. The good man that he is, he's been voted to be head of Grace Advance. Put the word grace in front of it. Um, Jose, would you close us in prayer since you, you saved uh, Tom's life or something? And I don't know what happened there. But why don't you, let's stand while Jose closes in prayer. And harass, Father. I see it every day, Father. And I pray, I pray, God, that you uh, help us to have the compassion and the will to do it, God Almighty. Mm -hmm. Just like your son had the will in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane mm -hmm. to do your will. Mm -hmm.
So I praise, praise to you always, Father God. I just pray, God, that you send us on our way and help us to, um, to really put this in our hearts and our mind and our soul to be consumed by this, Father, mm -hmm. so that nothing else consumes us, God, Father, my, my Lord. Help us not to worry about the things of the flesh, but to be concerned and, and to love your will and the spiritual gifts that you give us every day. I pray, God, that you have a, uh, give us a great evening with the men. Help us to fellowship and help us to discuss spiritual things that will build each other up, Father. Help the women as well, Father God, to sharpen one another and to love one another and to make sure that everything is being led spiritually. And praise be to you always. Thank you so much for the pastor and the message. Thank you so much for the men here, the women. Thank you so much for this church, which is the body. And it's your body. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.